In consequence, you all take actions that are legislative in nature, and you also take actions that are quasi-judicial in nature. What does that mean? Well, legislative is where you generally apply the law, or establish the law, that's uniform throughout the city. And then quasi-judicial actions, when you make application of a specific law, or requirement, regulation, to a specific situation, or in this instance, zonings or rezonings. And there are certain standards that need to be uh, adhered to when you act in those capacities. When you act in either capacity, it's important to observe fairness, due process, and it's important to have an open mind and to make decisions that are supported by what we refer to as competent substantial evidence and that are not arbitrary or capricious. And what I mean by that is decisions that are based on facts, evidence, testimony, whatever the information that you have that would be construed as competent substantial evidence. A reviewing court, or a court when it reviews your final actions, will follow certain standards in evaluating whether you, your action should be upheld or reversed. And it's a little different than legislative actions. Legislative actions that we take, such as assigning land use, or when you pass these resolutions, or when you do certain things in the legislative area, uh, those come to the court clothed with a certain degree of correctness, or a presumption. And a court, being the third branch of government, is loathed to interfere with the legislative branch of government there's some illegality or some problem with the constitutionality of the laws that you're trying to establish. And so, uh, in the quasi-judicial matter, it's a little different. Quasi-judicial doesn't necessarily come to a reviewing court clothed with a presumption of correctness, but it will have to be reviewed on whether you follow, uh, you know, whether the, the appropriate law was followed, and whether there was competent substantial evidence to support your decision. In either event, it's important to recognize that you conduct yourselves appropriately, not that you have it or that you won't, but I just wanted to remind you that when you go through these processes, uh, there are certain standards of conduct. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I'm talking about ex parte communications. Ex parte is a Latin phrase for the communications made to you all outside the course and scope of a public hearing. Now, we all know you all get emails. Get communications, people talk to you, constituents talk to you, of course. Um, you shop, you go to church, you live in the community, you're going to run into the constituents that you represent. And you're, they're going to have viewpoints, or they're going to have positions on matters that you all have to take action on. Um, generally speaking, in quasi judicial matters, my recommendation, I've said this to you before, is to refrain from expressing your viewpoint or establishing an opinion or coming up with a Conclusion, until such time as you have had an opportunity to review and hear all of the testimony and all the evidence at duly noticed hearings, public hearings. Uh, you may certainly have discussions with your constituents, receive what information they're willing to give you, but I, and as I have emailed to you, recommended, uh, don't commit uh, to anything and certainly don't prejudge or make any decisions until such time as you've had all the evidence and that's a fair decision in due process. And so uh, I, I wanted to, there's a certain, uh, there are certain issues that are on the agenda. Uh, and in particular, uh, we have 11, item 11A, 11C, and 11F. Those are transmittal public hearings, which are advertised to occur on Monday night. And those uh, are all land use. And the only action that you'll be taking on Monday night is to vote to transmit those land use ordinances to the Department of Economic Opportunity for the state agency to review in accordance with the, uh, the, the growth management laws that are in effect. That, that is not a substantive vote on, you're not making any legislative findings of consistency or compatibility or anything. You're simply voting to allow the ordinance to be transmitted to the at which point they'll review it, send it out to the various agencies and solicit comments. It will come back to you, likely in 30 to 40 days. And then there will be a second reading public hearing, at which you will then be asked to vote 
on the matter. And it won't be until then that a court or anyone would construe you have taken action on it. In the zoning context, there are often companion ordinances that deal with zoning, and those are a number of them. Uh, 11, uh, a, 11 uh, B, D, E, G, and H. And uh, those are all, uh, a court would like to construe those as quasi-judicial. And you will not do anything on Monday other than hear me read the titles to those ordinances. You're not going to be asked to take any action. You're not going to be asked to vote on a first reading. We don't do that in our we the rules and procedure that you've adopted. And those will then be held, and they will then be noticed for a subsequent public hearing, roughly 40 days, where you will then be asked to vote and take action on those things. And I just want to refresh so that everyone has a clear understanding of how the process works. Now, there are certain matters, and occasionally, conflicts of interest, or matters to ensure due process come up. And the, the statute that governs your requirements as public officials to vote is codified in the Florida statutes and it's 286.012. It basically says you really, the, the, the presumption is you have to vote. As a public official, you must vote on matters that are properly before you at the proper time. Of course, we, staff, and myself, we try to make sure that the proper procedure uh, is followed so that when you are asked to vote, that it's a proper vote. Uh, unless there are conflicts of interest which are specifically identified in a different part of the statute, such as Chapter 112, .313 at all. That's the Public Officers Code of Ethics. And the Commission on Ethics, the State of Florida Commission on Ethics, often construes that. But in general, you have a conflict if there's a special benefit generally money, either up or down, a detriment or a benefit, will it be or to you or your relatives as a result of the action you take? Now, the statute goes on to say that you may have an appearance of a conflict. You may not have an actual conflict, but there may be an appearance of a conflict. If there's an, now, if there's an actual conflict, then you shall not be. However, if there's an appearance of a conflict or a possible conflict, then you may, as an elected official, opt not to. In either event, I would recommend that you do three things, and I'll repeat this again on Monday. But in the event that you perceive that you have a conflict of interest, then I would say you announce the conflict prior to the consideration of the issue, that you abstain from voting, and that you file a mandatory conflict of interest for a meeting with the city clerk. And you've, a number of you have done that before, when you've had conflicts of interest come forward. And, and I would just encourage you to, to do that if you feel you have a conflict. Now, uh, why am I going through all this? Well, it's important to let the record be clear that uh, I have had conversations with a number of the commissioners, Commissioner Chiquetto, uh, and the statute goes on to say that in, when you're acting in a quasi-judicial that you as elected officials may, you know, something you're required to, but you may abstain from voting uh, in order to ensure a fair proceeding free from prejudice or bias. And courts have construed that. There's a circuit opinion out of the, uh, the 18th Judicial Circuit, City of Melbourne, that has construed that. There are commission ethics opinions that have construed that. But in general, uh, the situations where Mr. Chiquetto, for example, on the Mr. Schultz application, um, he has been very active uh, in his own association, as he has every right to be. Uh, and he's advocated for a certain position, as he has every right to be. Uh, and as a consequence of that, he and I have discussions. We've talked about it in depth. And he has determined, based on discussions that I've had with him, that it would be better for him, in this instance, for him to recuse himself. And so he will probably do that and make sure he make that announcement at the proper time. But that is as a result of his actions in promoting a certain viewpoint. And he'll go through the proper process, or at least I'll recommend that he do so. Uh, and in fact, when it's the appropriate time to talk or the commission receives information on that matter, I would even recommend the commission to kind of go to the podium and talk to you if he chooses to do so as a member of the community, a citizen resident. 
just to even be more clear on that point. Um, the other commissioner that I've had discussions with is Mayor Dantzler. And Mayor Dantzler uh, appeared at a Board of County Commission hearing on August 16th of 2016 for Mr. Schultz in favor of an application that he was making to the county to allow for some certain additional intensities in his Outback Oasis venue. And Mayor Dantzler, the minutes reflect that when he spoke, he was speaking as a, as a citizen. Uh, and he supported the fact, gave testimony to the fact that Mr. Schultz and his operations always adhere to the noise limitations. Uh, and that was the extent of it really involved in this, a separate land use issue involving the county. It was not the same issues that are before you on the applications that are made, and it involved some different plans. In addition, Mayor Dancer and I discussed that he is a co trustee of some lands in the, we'll call the ambient area, not directly adjacent, but in the general area, that he and his brothers and his mother have property uh, in what I would consider to be a very contingent vested interest in some property, unapproved property that is located in the county, um, that is in the general area, and that's just for information, but that does not require him to either abstain from voting as a result of a conflict of interest, or otherwise abstain from voting to ensure a fair process free from prejudice and bias. I'll let Commissioner Mayor Dancer speak to that issue himself, and I'm sure he will. But I just wanted to lay that for the record, um, and I know it's long-winded. I apologize for that, but I wanted to touch on the points that I thought were uh, said for you. And, and I may even go through this again on Monday, just so the record is clear. But I want to make sure that everyone understands the procedural aspects. You all, of course, need to vote how you deem appropriate when it's the opportunity for you to do so, based on the evidence that you hear or receive. But, uh, do y'all have any questions of me with regard to what I just said? Uh, maybe questions for the Thank city attorney? Alright, that's all I have. I'm sorry it's much longer than usual, but I wanted to make a good, good record for the proceedings. For those in the audience, John is our city attorney and his job is to keep us out of trouble. And that's what he's attempting to do with his long explanation. And uh, <coughs> we thank you, John, for trying to make sure everything is uh, cool. <laughs> Okay, so let's go through 11A. This is a public hearing. This is an administrative request to assign residential low density future land use to 53 annex parcels. And the companion is 11B. Uh, administrative request to assign a PUD zoning district to 53 annex parcels. This is the hall. Uh, city manager. Yeah, Mayor. Now, I keep thinking that these microphones are on. The, uh, I don't have anything to add. 11A and 11B, as you stated, are companion items. Uh, the, we recently annexed Valhalla, uh, I think in November of 2017 or so, and so this action is necessary because of, of bringing that subdivision into our city and the residents of the by a vote. Uh, so, unless anybody has any questions. Anybody have any questions on 11A? Yeah. 11C and D, these are same issue, this is a public hearing request by John Snyder, who's an agent of Four Rocks LLC, to assign residential low density future land use to two annex parcels. City Manager? Yeah, uh, I don't have anything to add unless you have any questions. Uh, C and D uh, are companion items, and uh, if you take action uh, on first reading on Monday, they'll proceed to second reading. Okay. 11E is a request by JSK Consultings to amend Plan Unit Development Ordinance 01856. City Attorney? Which one am I? For 11E. 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 Uh, that one is a uh, microphone, please. Yeah. That one is uh, a request to amend the PUD ordinance. So it's a rezoning. Um, I don't have anything to add that it's not already. You good? Yes. Okay. 
On to 11E and 11F, this is request, or excuse me, 11F and 11G. This is a request uh, by Paul William Schultz to assign residential low density and neighborhood activity center future land use to four annex parcels. This is the time that I need to read a statement before we move on. I just need to make sure that we're clear that before we begin these proceedings, I'd like to remind the applicant and the members of the general public that I am the co-trustee for my family's real property on Country Club Road, south of the general area of the property, which is the subject of the Paul Schultz applications. I have also, of my own choice, spoken in the past in support of the applicant at a Polk County Board of County Commission hearing in August 2016 regarding a separate land use matter involving extension of time to noise levels for the Outback Oasis. Even though I can and will participate and go fairly in this case based on the evidence presented to the City Commission at the public hearing on this matter, it is an important part of the due process to minimize even the appearance of any conflict of interest. City Attorney? Thank you, Mr. Thank you. City Attorney? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor Commission. After my long um, dissertation prior to, I don't have anything to add beyond that. Um, and, uh, you know, these matters are before you for public hearing uh, to simply transmit land use ordinance and of course the uh, PUD uh, will be simply on the title and you won't log on until it comes back for a second reading public hearing. City Manager. The, uh, I think the, uh, um, I think our, our growth management uh, team, I don't think, I, I know, I believe that that our road management team has been very thoughtful with respect to the development of the uh, staff recommendations uh, involving this particular development. Uh, it's a recommendation uh, that uh, we vetted internally uh, for a long period of time, which is very common with our leadership team. The, uh, we will take different roles and talk about things and we'll debate them uh, and then at the end of the day uh, we come out as a team and so uh, this um, the, the recommendation for this particular project uh, um, I support and not that that has any bearing on anything and I certainly don't say that in, in order for uh, my thoughts to have any bearing I just say that from the standpoint of this particular recommendation, I think that our team uh, could have, uh, they could have uh, been very difficult to work with. Uh, they could have, uh, they could have really sort of just ducked the whole thing and, and just simply said, you know, we're going to be very traditional in our thinking. And maybe they should have, but I think in this particular case, uh, what we've tried to do uh, in our philosophy all along has been to try to facilitate versus regulate. And not that we ignore regulation, I'm not saying that at least bit. And I certainly don't want our citizen friends to, to believe that because that's not the case. I think that that uh, there, there comes a time where you have to take a decision. It's not going to be popular. Uh, but I think that, that our team has, again, I think they've tried to be creative. I think they've tried to come up with a series of recommendations uh, working with the applicant. Uh, taking into account the greater character of the neighborhood uh, and respecting that character. Uh, and so we've developed this, we've developed a, a, a series of recommendations. Uh, and so the, uh, I don't have any comments beyond that. Uh, I'm certainly not a, a planner by trade. Uh, and so, uh, but I believe that economic development is important. I think that where you can support projects that promote ecotourism, I think that given the makeup of our community as a whole, I think it's important. Uh, I think that when you take a look at some of the concessions that the applicant uh, has been forthcoming to make, um, I believe that he has shown respect for the people that live there. The, uh, I've had the opportunity to tour that neighborhood on many occasions toured that neighborhood again on Friday and Saturday morning with uh, Commissioner Chicago. Uh, and the, um, I will say that the subdivisions that have come into the city over the years, as well as some of the subdivisions that have chosen to remain 
in the unincorporated area, but particularly those that have come into the city. And I've had a chance to take a look at, at a lot of subdivisions through my career by virtue of being in county government for the years that I was there, both as transportation director and as county manager. And Winter Haven uh, has some of the finest housing communities of any city in our county. Uh, and so, uh, for us to come up with a re series of recommendations that, in such a way, cause degradation to those fine communities and places where people call home, uh, I just don't think that that's what we're about. We're not always going to really agree, but I believe that civility is important, and I think that at times we have to be bold in our thinking if we're going to continue to promote in a positive way the development of our city. If we were to say that development stops now, then Cypress Gardens would have never, nothing would have ever been built around Cypress Gardens, and Cypress Gardens would have been built. You know, I was traveling with uh, Commissioner Chiquetto uh, on Saturday. The, I learned a lot. He pointed out several things to me. Um, I came back and I visited the staff. I felt that we had responded to those. We may agree to disagree respectfully. But one of the things we talked about was the widening of State Road 542. And I said to Commissioner Chacal, I said, gee, I wonder what these folks thought. I hope they just didn't wake up one day and all of a sudden find out that 542 was being widened because Obviously, that's a pretty serious widening occurring out there on 542. But when you think about the fact that progress is going to happen, investment in the city and the county have wanted 542 widened since your brother was in the legislature. Because I was just a kid who was town manager out there in Dundee. And I remember visiting with him about the importance of trying to get 542 widened because uh, going to the uh, uh, to the east, that would be a major gateway into Dundee. And of course, we were trying to promote the US 27 corridor uh, because that was really the community's only opportunity for commercial growth. Uh, and so progress, progress is going to happen. Hopefully it's responsible progress. Um, it's a decision that you all have been here long enough to know. I've known you all for many years. You're going to be extremely thoughtful in your deliberations, and you're going to be extremely respectful to yourselves, uh, between yourselves, and also the community. Uh, and so, um, it's not often uh, that I speak out on road management matters. Um, uh, this is a project that, that uh, um, meeting with staff, uh, and I meet with any applicant if they, if they ask to meet with me. And then in this particular case, the applicant did ask me, and I did so, and I listened. And I talked about several things that, that I thought could be objections, and that I thought perhaps would be valid objections. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, this is an occasion where I'm going to support staff recommendation. I know the city commission will decide what you're going to do, and you'll always make a very thoughtful decision, so thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Are we going to have staff present? Because I know there's been some changes since the planning commission. Merle, you were here to uh, talk about changes that have been made or are not. Okay. There is a uh, summary. Merle, would you like for us to let you finish and then ask your questions or ask your questions as you go? It doesn't matter. Okay. So I'm just going to see if anybody has questions in the room. If you want to just the, uh, answer them, go ahead. Well, I think there is a summary uh, in the staff report on page 6, I believe, under Planning Commission recommendation, a summary of the changes. And I'll just, if you want, I'll just read through those. Uh, well, let me, let me preface my remarks by saying uh, the concept has not changed of what uh, is being proposed, and that is to develop 
subject area, which is 69.2 acres, with an aging in place concept, which introduce, which includes a mixture of residential uses marketed to individuals over the age of 55. Uses would include a combination of detached active adult residences, attached low-rise condominiums, or townhouses, and an assisted living facility. To support these residential uses and other nearby residential uses, a small 9.3-acre neighborhood commercial area will be provided near the development's intersection with Country Club Road and includes the existing Outback Oasis event venue that is envisioned to continue and support the aging in place community as a recreation and open space. So that's, that's the concept that has been proposed. Specifically, the maximum number of units will be reduced by 20% from 500 units to 400 units. And again, those are, uh, would be allowed within the mixture that's proposed, the, the uh, PUD concept plan identifies specific areas and the uses that would be allowed in those areas uh, within the maximum of 400 units. The overall amount of commercial square footage will be reduced from 50,000 square feet to 40,000 square feet, and no commercial space except for a non-commercial 8,000 square foot indoor event venue for the existing Outback Oasis will be constructed until such time as a safe road connection to Dundee Road is completed. So therefore, no commercial will be built within the Neighborhood Activity Center until such time as that road connection from Dundee Road to Country Club Road is completed. Of the proposed redu reduced 40,000 square feet of commercial space, no more than 10% or 4,000 square feet shall be for retail uses. And again, that would not be built until the safe road connection is completed. A minimum of 40% of the subject property will be restricted to remain as open space. All buildings located within 500 feet of Country Club Road and 300 feet from the neighborhood pro neighboring properties located southeast of the subject area shall be a maximum of two floors in height. The maximum height for assisted living facility and attached senior housing building shall be three floors. No amplified sound will be permitted outside and that specifically includes the Outback Oasis uh, facility. The developer will construct the Sage Road extension through their property from Country Club Road to the southern boundary in phases corresponding with adjacent construction. The developer will direct all construction vehicles and emergency vehicles to access the property from the south on Sage Road. And I would also uh, point out that there was a provision in the uh, proposal that if the Sage Road were, was not completed within 10 years, that the right-of-way dedication would revert back to the property owner. We have removed that revert of provision that the dedication of the right of 60 foot right-of-way for construction of Sage Road would, would not revert back. It would be dedicated to the city for a public roadway. So let me make sure I understand because I was looking at the map. So Sage Road will go from Country Club Road out to 542 Dundee Road. That is correct. And that will that's right there by the shell station or whatever it is now at the traffic line. Yes, sir. So that <coughs> because we've been told that uh, FDOT will not put a traffic light at Country Club Road and Dundee Road. That is my understanding, yes sir. So that would be a connector road for people on a Country Club Road to go down Sage Road from Country Club Road to uh, down Sage Road to Dundee Road and we have a traffic light. That is correct. And then also uh, applicants 
prepared to build an 8,000 square foot activity center where all the outdoor activities that would normally be could be moved inside. That is correct. There will be no amplified agreed to restricting a restriction of no amplified sound or music at the uh, outback oasis. Two questions I'm getting. I've got a lot of emails. The, <clears throat> so there's no more five-story buildings now. There's no more five-story buildings. It's three floors. The applicant has requested that the actual there would still be three floors, but the actual height would be restricted to 55 feet. That the reason for that would allow them to do a pitch roof. So it would uh, facilitate the construction of this facility rather than looking institutional or like maybe a hospital. It would resemble more of a lodge. Okay. And I've asked this question of um, you, all you guys. And let's say we, we vote no on this and the applicant then comes back and says he wants to put a regular subdivision in there under County zoning or city zoning, we estimated uh, how many hound homes do you think could potentially be put there? Uh, 200. 200. 200. At least 200. 200 and uh, over two, around 200 homes? Over 200. Okay. Yeah. So that, that could potentially happen regardless of whether you have a PUD or not. Then you've got very little control of what goes right? Is that a fair? Or would it be no. a PUD? No, it would not need to be a PUD. He could request a uh, a straight um, zoning classification for that. Under the, when it was in the county, it was residential low under the comprehensive plan, which would allow up to five units per acre. However, the sub district restricted it was residential low one, or L1, which restricted it to 40,000 square foot lots. With the ability to go up to the maximum of five as a PUD approved by the Planning Commission only if he met certain requirements to get density bonus points for that. And we use that and did the calculation to determine that that could be achieved, but again, that, that would require a public hearing for a PUD to get up to that level of development just as a straight uh, subdivision. That would be in common. That would, I'm sorry, that yes, that would be in the county. The city's comparable uh, land use, RL, residential low, allows up to 10 units per year. But again, we have zoning that we would apply a zoning to that, and the R1 zoning is three per acre. Is three per acre. So 69 acres times three. Times three. Say 70, 70 times three is 210, so that's why you're right. saying roughly 200 lots. Right. What would happen to the Sage Road connector if we did it that way, if that was the ultimate? Well, I would, I would first of all, I would anticipate that, the, uh, that a developer that would build a typical subdivision, standard subdivision, would not need to develop a connector road such as Sage Road. He would just have a connection onto Country Club Road within a subdivision like the other subdivisions along Country Club Road have. So I would doubt that the connectivity of Sage Road would happen with a straight residential uh, request. And also having anything from what Commissioner Powell, this is the first time. I'm not, I've heard of this, but I'm just remembering they're going to build something and all the activities that are now outdoors will be indoors. Is that, is that what you said? Well, yeah. The request is to build an 8,000 square foot meeting conference space within the um, on the Oasis. Activity Center. Is that on the Outback Oasis? Or no, no, no that's on the Outback Oasis. That's at near the intersection of the connection of the Sage Road extension, I'll call it. Okay. Uh, and, and by doing so, all activity that currently takes place at Outback Oasis, from the standpoint of events, would take place inside of 
restriction of any against any amplified noise or music at the outback places. Outside. 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 Yes, outside. That's a maximum big that. Yeah, that would, and then he pointed out that's a maximum of eight thousand oh. square feet. Oh. Yeah, one more question. I'm going to let Commissioner Taylor ask you. How many acres are now back oasis? You know? Approximately five. How many? Five. Five, okay. Commissioner Chiquetta? Just a general question on, on uh, Sage Road. That, that road is currently uh, in the county, right? Sage Road is currently in the county, yes. Uh, what's constructed of it? And what, what side of the road or what type of road is that? It is currently a, it's an improved road, but it's not paved. It's a, essentially an open grade mix. And it's road. classified as what kind of road? I would believe it's probably a, a, a local road right now. Yeah, a local road. And so the applicant, in this case, does, does he own or does he not own all the way down? He does not own all the way down to the pipe. How much of that is left, if you will? 1,100 feet, I believe. 1,100 feet. Right. The right away that had to be acquired. There's one portion, there is sufficient right of way to make the improvements except for one small portion that's only 30 feet. Yeah. Well, what's the distance of that? Maybe 500 feet. Or maybe 500 feet. Maybe. I don't think it's that far. Or probably less. You say that again, I'm talking. There is one portion of it that would be, that's only 30 feet that additional right of way would need to be required for less than 500 feet. No, 30 feet of width for 500. The, uh, I would also point out that, that the road, the connection of Sage Road, which as you pointed out has been, I think someone pointed out, has been, uh, well, the completion or the widening of I-42 has been anticipated for a long time. We also determined that the connection of Sage Road to uh, Country Club Road had also been apparently anticipated. It, it is a, identified in the master transportation plan of the city's conference plan as a connecting road from 542 to Country Club Road. And the 20, 20, 2015 transportation master plan, and then also a secure <laughs> 20 and 2025 master plan. And I would say that if that connection is made, because it would go from essentially a, an arterial to an urban collective, which is Country Club Road, that it would be reclassified as a collective road. And, and when, when we identify the uh, neighborhood activity center, we recognize that as a proposed collective road with that connection because of the conference plan. Just, I just want to clarify, the applicant you said earlier does not own he does not 500 or 1100 feet. Does not. So how does the city and or the applicant who is basically trying to get an approval get that additional right of way to make it safer? Well, I, I, I would say in my estimation that the, I think the chances would be good for that for property owners in this area that access Sage Road to contribute to that, I mean, I've seen that happen before, or with the possibility of the connection, the county would be willing to, I, I don't have a good answer for that, but the possibility is created that that connection could be made with this development. And then if the Sage Road would intersect with the Country Club Road somewhere? The Sage Road extension intersects with Country Club Road, yes. And what is the proposal on Country Club Road for the interchange, for the interchange that you're going to create with Sage Road? That hasn't been designed yet. Would it be a lighted intersection? At Country Club and Sage Road? Right. I don't know. I don't know what the traffic counts or traffic warrants would require. Green space, you said mentioned that there's 40% green space. 40% would, 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 be, uh, would be open space. Is that just like not, nothing built on it? Nothing that, built on it. That's a matter of definition. Is that normal? What's the regular subdivision or what's a typical? That, is probably, that would be more.
more than would be typically required for a typical subdivision. However, I have to say that there is a portion of this property, I don't recall the exact acreage, that was uh, used for this, this safe road landfill that was kind of like construction debris type landfill. And there is restrictions against uh, building on that area for any structures on that area. So I don't know, I can't tell you what the resulting percentage of open space would be if a typical subdivision were to be designed on this property. But I would guess it would be something less than 50%. I really can't say for sure. Okay. Well, yes. Yeah. Any you wouldn't have the Sage Road extension. Right. If you did a typical subdivision of Sage Road, and, and Sage Road was not, would not be part of it. I would not anticipate the Sage Road connection between the southern property boundary and Country Club Road would be included in that scenario. Right. That will be buildable if you put a road on so it be. Right. Anybody else? In, in our, uh, I'm, this was come up before, did we ever get any um, information? I know you said uh, in, before that in our discussion that the uh, capital improvement program that showed uh, the state road connection for the purchase of this particular property for recreation was in our CIP at one time. I could not find that. Uh, I talked to Cal, to Cal uh, Bowen, I talked to T. Michael Stavers. And I, I could not identify that is not currently in the capital previous plan. Did we take it out at some particular time? I don't believe I'd have to refer to Cal because I don't believe we could de determine that it was ever part of the capital service plan. Uh, maybe Commissioner Skeeter did when I went back and looked through past CIPs, there is a designation in there of looking to reacquire Sage Road several years back before we had done the final transaction, I believe in 2015 it was to Mr. Billy Joe Watson was part of the agreement we had arranged for. Um, there was never any funding allocated for that. It was when we were looking to um, sell off the Chain of Lakes property. That was one of the properties that we looked at as a possible site to relocate uh, some of those recreation facilities to that we'd be losing in that process. Um, it's, it, it's noted within the CIP as a placeholder, but there was never any funding or uh, what I would say is a legitimate proposal to, to actually do that is more so we can get this property for recreational lands and uh, that's something at that time, but it's not in our CIP for the past several years. But it, but it was identified in there. I'm sorry? It was identified in the CIP. It was put as tag in there at one point, yes sir. Yeah. And that was in 2015, right? I'd have to go back and look at the actual CIP. It's a five-year CIP, so I'm not sure what, what, what the last budget year was that it would have shown up, if I can find that out for you. Anybody else know JP Edmore? I could just I could see one thing that by doing it as requested, we don't have to worry about schools. The uh, impacts associated with a over 55 uh, community uh, definitely would be less than uh, a typical subdivision that would have families. There would be no impacts to schools and traffic impacts would be comparable or less. The, the population for this type of development is estimated, it was estimated in the application to be 1.9 uh, persons per unit. The typical single family home has 2.5 persons per unit. 1.9 versus 2.5 right. people? Yes. I would hate to be that point nine. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Commission, also I'd love to remind you um, that you're not the one, the point nine, um, but that uh, if you have received any emails or if you've received any written communications from anyone regarding this matter, if you could please forward those over to the city clerk so that a record, a proper record can be made, they can become part of the proceedings and they can be disclosed prior to the time when you're going to be asked to take any formal action on these matters. And that, I'll be happy to assist in that. Maybe they need to go over to the city clerk.
so that she could include them uh, in a record. Yes. yes. Are you asking us to say yes? Well, I'm just asking for you to do that. Yes, yes, we all I know you probably have received a lot of emails and different things. Right. So if you would be, if you would be so kind as to do that, I would. And that's the city part. Okay. And just a reminder what we will be voting on Monday night will be whether to transmit this to the state versus uh, any kind of zoning approval at this point. So, yes, that's right. Along with item 11A, 11C, and 11F, those will be the and any of that's more procedural. Right. You're simply transmitting it, you're not uh, that action necessarily saying that you support them a lot of importance. You're not making any findings, that's for sure. And for those of you that want to weigh in on this, Monday night you'll have uh, time to come to the podium and speak and 